Welcome to this new video tutorial where we will talk about this thing we just looked at. But what is it that we just watched? Well, that was Dijkstra's algorithm for finding the shortest path between two vertices in a graph. And if none of that makes any sense right now, don't worry, stick around till the end of the video and I promise everything will be clear. To be able to understand anything that we'll discuss in the video, we first have to take a quick look at graphs, what they are and how they work. After that, we'll discuss what problem Dijkstra's algorithm is solving and how it does it, and then we'll code the solution and see how it runs line by line. So this is the plan for this video. Let's not waste any more time and jump into it. So what are graphs? In computer science, a graph is a data structure composed of objects called vertices or nodes and all the connections between them, which are usually called edges or links. In the graph we see here, the vertices are the letters from A to F, and the edges are the connections between them. We can see that A is linked to B, C and D, B to A, C and E, and so on. The edges can be directed or undirected. A directed edge allows only one-way access between vertices. So if the edge between A and C would be directed, we can go from A to C using that edge, but not the other way around. We can go from C to A using other routes if they are available, but not directly. As far as C is concerned, there is no direct link between them. An undirected edge allows access both ways with no restrictions. I can go from B to E and also from E to B. Edges can also have numbers associated with them, usually called weights. Depending on the context, they can be used to either represent the strength of the connection, the cost of going from one vertex to another, or just any other value that describes the edge. You can imagine that such a structure can be used to represent a wide variety of relationships and situations from many real-world domains. Network meshes are one example where graphs are used. An IT infrastructure can be modelled with computers as the vertices and the connections between them as the edges. Another example which we're very much used to is a social network. Using a graph, we can represent all the relationships and friendship statuses we see in an app such as Facebook. The vertices would be the users, and whenever they befriend or unfriend someone, an edge would either be created or removed between them. And in this particular example, the edges would be undirected, because a friendship is a mutual connection. You couldn't really say that person A is a friend of B, but not vice versa. In other scenarios, our graph might become directed. In an app like Twitter, for instance, it's possible for person A to follow person B, but B to not follow back. So this action would only go one way, therefore the edge would be directed. Weights can also be added to edges to represent the strength of the connection. The people you interact with the most could be assigned a greater value, which can later be used to prioritise their content and show it at the top of the feed. And lastly, one of the most complex real-world applications for graph theory is the GPS system. The streets and roads of a certain area are represented by a network of vertices and edges, and whenever we want to travel from one place to another, there's an algorithm that calculates the directions to our destination. This means that the edges will have to contain a weight associated with them, which can be the distance or the travel time for driving, cycling or walking. These values will all be computed and added together to give us the fastest or the shortest route. So this is a general overview of the graph data structure. As we just saw, graphs have many real-world applications and in some of them, finding the shortest path between vertices is crucial. The GPS is the best example. Knowing the shortest route between two points is not only convenient, but it also carries strong financial interests, both for individuals and also companies like couriers or transportation companies. There are many shortest path algorithms, but the one we're looking at today is probably the most well known. It was designed by the Dutch computer scientist Edsger Dijkstra in 1956, when he wanted to know the shortest way to travel between two cities. It remains since then as one of the best algorithms for this kind of problem, and it served as the basis for many others developed afterwards. OK, so let's see how this algorithm works by taking this graph we have here as an example. 
For simplicity's sake, all the edges will be undirected, and they'll have a weight assigned to them. By the way, all the weights have to be greater than zero, since Dijkstra's algorithm works only with positive numbers. There are other algorithms that handle this situation, but we won't bother with that today. So, in this graph we have here, let's say that we want to find the shortest distance from A to F. How can we do that? Well, you might be tempted to take a guess based on which route feels shorter. Or maybe you did some quick math and added the routes together and figured out the answer. These approaches, however, only work because the graph is really small and we can calculate all the distances pretty easily. But try to solve this problem as if you were to physically find yourself in point A and you only know that you have to reach some point F. In this case, you wouldn't really know what distances you have to travel or even the number of vertices you encounter. In a sense, everything apart from these two points would be a mystery. And if that's the case, where do we even begin? Well, in this scenario, we'll have to do the only thing we can do, which is to start travelling to the direct connections of our starting point. So, from A, we go to B, then C, and then D. And while we do that, we write down the distances we have to travel. This means that we need some sort of storage to keep and update the information as we go. For our case, we could use a table, with vertices as the rows and all the relevant information as columns and the first one would be the distances. Here, we'll store the shortest distances from the starting point to all the nodes. The first one would be A. And since that's our start, the shortest distance from A to A is, well, zero. I don't have to travel any distance from where I am to where I am. Then we have B, C and D. And we already discovered these distances on our first trip, so we write them down. Remember, this column tells us the shortest distances from A to all these other vertices. For now, the shortest distance from A to D, for instance, is 4 because that's the only one we discovered so far. But this might change if we find another route that's shorter. So what about the last two vertices? Well, since we haven't discovered them yet, we might as well consider the worst case scenario and mark them as infinity for now. Another thing we can keep track of is the previous vertex. This will tell us how we reached all the other vertices. For A, we wouldn't have any value since we didn't reach A from any other vertex. That's our starting point. But for B, C and D, we have A as the previous value. The shortest distance for all these vertices was reached through A. The other ones will not have any value for now because we haven't discovered them yet. The last thing we'll keep in this table is the visited vertices. So far, we only visited A, so all the other ones will be marked as not visited. Now, you might be asking yourself, wait a minute, we already visited B, C and D. Why aren't we marking them as well? Well, it's because that's not what we mean when we say visited. We only mark a vertex as visited when we're actually exploring its neighbours. Imagine these vertices are cities and we start in the centre of A. We mark it as visited because we're already in it. Then we travel to B in order to discover the distance, but we don't enter B. We stop just outside the city entrance, because we still have the two other neighbours of A to visit. So we go back to A and start travelling to C. Same thing here, we don't enter C but stop right outside of it and then go back to A to finally travel to D. And only now that we know the distances to all of A's neighbours, we move inside B, we mark it as visited, and try to explore all its neighbours. B has connections to A, C and E. A is already visited, and because our graph is undirected and the distance from A to B is the same as from B to A, we'll skip the vertices we already visited any time we encounter them. So we don't do anything with the distance from B to A and move to B's next neighbour, which is C. And now we have a situation. We found another way to travel to C. We already know we can reach C from A, but now we found another route through B. Which one is shorter? Remember, our goal is to find the shortest path from A to F. But if we find more than one way to travel between two vertices, we need to choose the shorter one, because for all we know, that in turn could give us the shortest path to our final destination. This means that we need another variable to keep track of, which we can call the new distance. 
Our new distance to C is calculated by adding the newly discovered distance from B to C, which is 2, to the current shortest distance from A to B, which just happens to be the direct connection between those two. And now we compare the new distance, which is 5, to what we knew until now was the shortest distance to C, which is 6. Since the new distance is less than the current one, we have to update the table to reflect that. I know this drawing doesn't seem to show that, but imagine the road from A to C is a winding mountain road, and the one from A to B to C is a highway. So we update the shortest distance to C to be 5, and the previous node that got us there is B. The next neighbour of B is E. E is a new vertex which we haven't seen before, so we want to calculate the shortest path to it. And we do it the same way we did it for C. We take the newly discovered distance from B to E and add it to the shortest distance we know from A to B. And after that, we want to compare it to the current shortest path to E. In our case, that's infinity, since it's the first time we encountered it. So we just update that value to be 6. We also add B as the previous node that got us to E. And now we've finished with B, so we move on to the next vertex. But let me ask you, which one should it be? C, D, or maybe E? Well, we will visit all of them eventually, but we want to always prioritise the shortest path. And how do we know which is the shortest path? For this, we need another structure called a priority queue. You can think of a priority queue as a list in which elements have a certain number assigned to them based on which they'll be prioritised. And the one with the highest priority will be first to be removed. The definition of high priority depends on each use case. For us, it will be the distance. The shorter the distance, the higher the priority. In the example we see here, C has the priority of 1, which is the lowest distance in this list, so it will be the first one to be removed when it comes to that. After C is gone, the element with the smallest number will be prioritised next. In our case, that's D. If D is removed, F will be the next one in line. But if we add a new item, it will also follow the same rules. H, the new element, has a priority of 1, so it will take precedence over F. The classic real-world example of priority queues is a hospital's ER, where patients are taken care of based on the severity of their condition and not the arrival time. It's a similar idea here. The lowest numbers will be served first. So, coming back to our example, our priority queue should contain the vertices we travel to but haven't visited already. E with a priority of 6, C with a priority of 5, and D with 4. Based on the rule we just established, D is the one with the higher priority. So what we'll do is take it out of the queue and mark it as visited. We now want to start travelling to all of D's neighbours. The first one is A, but since that one's already visited, we ignore it and go to F. Since F is a new vertex, we want to calculate its total distance from A. We add the newly discovered distance from D to the shortest distance we had from A to D. We compare the total to the distances entry for F, and we add it to the table along with the previous vertex that got us to F. But there's one more thing we need to do, which is to add both F and its distance to the priority queue because we need to visit it in the future. And with that done, we go again to the queue and take out the vertex with the shortest known distance, which is C. We mark it as visited and go over to its neighbours. A and B are already visited, so we try E. The total distance, A, B, C, E, is larger than what we currently know as the shortest distance to E, which is A, B, E, so we don't do anything here and we move on to F. The new distance to F would be 8, which is smaller than the current distance we had until now, which was coming from D. So we update the distance for F, we update the previous node to be C, and we also want to update the priority in the queue for F. The next one in the queue is E, and its only unvisited neighbour is F, so we calculate the new distance which turns out to be 7. We compare it with the known shortest distance to F, which was 8, coming from C. Since the new distance is shorter, we update the distance value in the table, which vertex got us there, and also the priority in the queue. 
We take out the last element from the queue, which happens to be our destination, and since all its neighbors are already visited, the algorithm can stop. Okay, but now, how do we know the shortest path? Well, we have to look at the table. The first column tells us the shortest path from A to all the other vertices. And this is the thing about Dijkstra's. It's considered a greedy algorithm. It will not only calculate the shortest path from our start to the destination, but from start to all the other vertices. And the way you find the path to your destination is by looking at the previous column. For our case, the shortest distance to F is 7, and we got there from E. And if we look at E's previous vertex, we see it's B. And B's previous was A. If we reverse that, we get the final path, A, B, E, F. And that's the entire algorithm. If we were to lay out all the steps we just described, they would look something like this. If you want to try and code this yourself, I encourage you to do so. If not, we'll see the solution in just a minute. But before we do that, I just want to talk about how we're going to store all these vertices and edges. What kind of data structure can we use to represent a graph in code? Well, there are typically two ways of doing it. One is with an adjacency matrix, and the other is with an adjacency list. For simplicity, in this video, we'll use the list, and it looks something like this. The graph will be a simple Python class with an adjacency list attribute. I use classes since they're pretty intuitive regardless of what programming language you're used to, but there are certainly other alternatives. You can use whatever structure type you want. There is no best way to store and access vertices and edges. It all depends on the context. The adjacency list itself is going to be a dictionary where all the keys are the vertices and their corresponding values will be a list of edges. For the vertices, we could use another class with a value attribute. In our examples, the values are just letters, but they could be any data type. The edges will also be classes and will contain two attributes, a distance, which is the weight we talked about at the beginning of the video. I decided to name it distance since it fits the theme of the video better. And the second attribute is the vertex this edge is connected to. So in our example, the key A is a vertex, and inside its corresponding list, we have all its connections represented as edge objects. B and its distance, the edge to C with its distance, and the one to D. And that's basically how we interpret this adjacency list. I hope this makes it clear. All right, now let's go back to our algorithm and start coding it. We'll start by defining a function that takes the graph and a starting vertex as arguments. We could also add an end parameter if we wanted to also calculate the root, but we would then need more code, so we'll keep it simple and only have the start. We then want a way to store the contents of our table, the distances, previous, and visited values. This can be done in many ways, depending on the language you're using and how you decide to implement the algorithm, but in this video, we'll use Python dictionaries. This syntax is called a dictionary comprehension and it's how we can initialize them with default values. For the previous, the defaults will be none, for the visited we'll have false, and for the distances, infinity. We also must not forget to update the distance to the starting vertex to zero. The next step would be to initialize the priority queue. Now, priority queues are generally implemented using a data structure called a heap, but going through such a topic would require at least a couple of videos like this one, so what I'll do is use this code I found in the Python official docs. This is a heap implementation that can be used as a priority queue. I'll modify it by wrapping it in a class, add a double underscore len method to help us with checking if it's empty, and slightly tweak some of its methods. And that should be it. This is the priority queue we'll be using. I'll leave a link in the description with the source of this code if you're interested in reading more about it. I won't go into details since it's not the subject of this video. Okay, so going back to the algorithm. When we initialize the queue, we'll create an instance of the class we just saw, and then add to it zero as the distance and the starting vertex. We start a loop that goes until the queue is emptied by simply saying while queue, and we remove the vertex with the highest priority using the pop task method, remembering to save the distance and the vertex. 
Marking the removed vertex as visited is as simple as changing the value in the visited dictionary. And then to loop over the neighbors of the removed vertex, we'll use a for loop over its adjacency list. If the current neighbor is already visited, we continue to the next one in the list. And if not, we want to calculate the new distance to the vertex. This is done by adding the distance removed from the queue to the distance of the current neighbor. If this new distance is less than what we have in the distances dictionary for the current neighbor, we want to update the distance of this neighbor to be the new distance. We want to make the previous vertex of the neighbor the removed vertex. And lastly, we want to add the new distance and the vertex to the queue. We can then return out of the function, and that should be it. What I want us to do next is go through the entire algorithm line by line to really get a grasp on how it works. And for that, I'll bring up a new graph, this time from A to H, and also have its adjacency list representation here to the left. The two vertices we want to find the shortest path between are A and H. And let's begin. The first few lines will just create the previous dictionary, which is going to look like this. The visited dictionary, and the distances. Line 5 will then set the distances value for the start vertex to 0. We then initialize the priority queue and add the first vertex and its distance. We're also going to use some other variables during this execution and we'll keep track of those here to the right. Next, we enter the while loop. Line 9 will remove from the queue the highest priority element and save it in the removed variables. We then mark the removed vertex as visited, and at line 11 we start iterating over all its edges. The removed vertex was A, so the first edge in this iteration is B. We check if we already visited it, and since we haven't, we jump to line 14, where we calculate the new distance. B's distance is 1.8, the removed distance is 0, so the total is 1.8. At line 15, we check if this value is smaller than what we currently have as the shortest distance for b. That being infinity, the if condition is true, and we move to line 16 where we update the distance for b. We set the previous entry for b to be a, and add to the queue b and its distance. The iteration will move to the next edge in a's adjacency list, which is c. We again check if it's visited. We calculate the new distance, update the entries in the tables, and add it to the queue. We repeat the same steps for A's last edge, which is D. All these edges were never discovered, so the logic is the same for all. But after we're done with D, the for loop breaks, since we exhausted all of A's edges, and we move back to line 8. Since the queue is not empty, the while condition is true, and we go ahead and remove the vertex with the higher priority, which is D. Line 10 will mark it as visited, and then we start iterating over all its edges. A is the first edge in D's list, but when line 12 checks if it's visited, we can see that A is marked as true, so the continue statement will be executed, jumping back to 11 and the next edge in D's list. F is not visited, so we calculate the distance to it by adding the removed distance, which is the one from A to D, to the one from D to F, and we get 4.1. This is less than what we have in the distances table for F, so we update that, we set the previous vertex for F to be D, and then add it to the queue. You'll notice that the queue will rearrange its elements, like it did just now. I made it that way so that the lowest distance will always be the last element in the list. This is not 100% true to how the priority queue works under the hood, but that's not important here. I just wanted to have a smooth way of adding and removing elements in this animation. Okay, so coming back, the next edge in D's list is G, and that's never been visited, so we calculate the distance to it, and since it's less than infinity, we update the distances table, the previous table, and add it to the queue. Since that was the last edge in D's list, we go back to line 8, and because the queue is not empty, we continue to line 9. Now at this point I was thinking to end the video here, since the same steps are going to be repeated over and over, but then I thought that some of you would like to see it go until the end. So what I'll do is stop with all the explanations, 
but let the rest of the video run until the algorithm finishes, in case you want to analyze it further. So let me know in the comments what you think about this style of video, if you found it useful and would like to see more like it. And if you enjoyed it, give it a like and subscribe to the channel. It helps reach more people and enables me to do more. As promised, I'll leave you with the rest of the code execution. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.